Hi guys. Hello everyone. How are you all doing? Yay! City class. We all made it. Um, sorry for the logistical nightmare that was putting this class together. I know a lot of you received a lot of strange emails and people are confused about registration and this and that and the other thing. I'm sorry. There's a lot of you. Um, 2.30 to 5 p.m. today, I'm just going to stand here, and if you have no idea what your registration status is, come talk to me, and we'll just work it out. Um, if you've got other questions, yes. too, we'll be here to answer them. Um, also, can people in the back hear okay? Like, Good. thumbs up? Okay, nice. Can anyone read my hand? I guess the better question is, can anyone read my handwriting? Not, okay, great. So, that's good. Um, and also, I guess before we start, thank you all for signing up for this class. This is like so amazing to see all of you here, um, excited to learn hardware design. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. We just have a couple of things to say before we really get started. Um, yeah. Do you want to? Sure. Um, so as we sent out, there's three ways to partake in the class, track one, track two, track three. Um, if you're track three, you've already been talking to us, so um, most people here are gonna be track one or track two. Um, if you are in track one, um, you will be building a Bluetooth speaker that looks about like this. Um, once people come in, I'll pass it around so you can get a look at it. Um, this is an earlier prototype. But um, you'll be building one of those upstairs in lab, um, but you need to have a lab section to do that in. Um, labs are gonna be 10 a.m. to um, we're gonna have lab time during 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and you'll sign up for a two hour chunk in there. So uh, either 10 to two or, or sorry, uh, 10 to 12 or 12 to two or two to four. Um, I sent that email out for lab signups. If anybody didn't get it, please let me know after the lecture. And if anybody, there was another thing I was gonna say and I completely forgot. Yeah, if you're it, not signed up for a lab, section, a lab section, sign come up talk for to one. Me. Um, Also, if you are track two, you do not need to sign up for a lab section. There's not an explicit lab part of the class. We're about to talk about that. Yep. For track two, um, basically how we're gonna run this is you guys can design and build whatever you want. Um, if you want to build the motor controller project, we have that all ready for you to go. If you guys are interested in motors and motor control, you can design and build that PCB. If there's mm -hmm. something else you wanna do for your Europe, your personal project, or something like that, you are free to design that as well. We cannot fund the project yet. We're a little low on funding, so we can't actually pay for you to build it. However, if you build, if you like design something really cool by the end of the class, like I will work with you to help get you the funding to build the thing. Yep. Um, that being said, if you are track two, project proposals are due to us by Wednesday. It doesn't need to be insane. It can be a paragraph, just simple, emailed to me and Fisher, so you could be like, like this is what I'm thinking about designing and so we can tell you if it's like complicated enough or not to achieve the track two um, stuff. Yep. Um, the, there is something else on this list. Um, all of this information, by the way, is on pcb.mit.edu. Or it will be tonight. I mean, there's not yet, yeah. but um, it will be. <laughs> but feel free to go ahead and check out that website. There's a bunch of content on there. Um, lecture notes are there, lecture recordings will be there after the lecture happens. Um, syllabus is there and a bunch of other things as well. Yes, and um, so if you go look at the schedule online, there's a schedule page. Um, it is fully updated in terms of when lectures and labs will occur. In terms of due dates for track one and track two, mm -hmm. fully ignore those after week one. They are wrong. I need to fix them because we sh shifted some things around, but all the due dates in week one are correct and we'll let you know about things week two and onwards as soon as possible. Um, the, um, so for track one, you guys are gonna be designing a Bluetooth speaker and you're going to be po like doing the schematic and layout of the PCB on your own. We will design review those individually with you, us and the lab staff. Also say hello to our wonderful lab staff. Right. Raise your hands In the please. front row, yay lab staff. Um, they will be helping you with labs throughout the throughout IEP as will we mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. Um, you will be actually building the circuit board in groups of two just because we didn't have funding for 160 PCBs. Um, sad, mm -hmm. but yes. Yeah. So we will not be assigning you buddies. Um, please find a buddy mm -hmm. at some point if you are track one. 
If you need help finding a buddy, let us know, um, and we can we can get you assigned to someone. Yep. Um, just make sure your buddy is in your lab section because it is very hard to populate a PCB when you're not there at the same time. You can't really do it together if you're not there together. Um, if anybody has lab sec lab section assignments are on the sh Google sheet that's called roster that I sent out like three days ago. If you have no idea where that is or what I'm talking about, come find me after lecture. I'll tell you what your right. lab assignment is. Cool. Cool. Um, um, anything else? I don't know. Cool. Okay. Um, only other thing is go ahead and sign up for the class Piazza as well. Uh, the link is on the website. I think it's under the syllabus page. Um, we'll, we're going to try and direct a lot of communication through there because wrangling you know, so many students is like really, really hard on our end. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to put them out there. Um, us or one of the lab staff will get back to you um, as soon as we can. Okay, yeah. Cool. Cool. You want to talk about motorcycles? I would love to talk about motorcycles. Take, take it away. Okay. So I will I will preface this lecture a little bit um, because I think it's I think it's somewhat important so that you're not sitting here going like why is he talking about motorcycles for an hour and a half during PCP design class? Sorry. Let me put this ridiculous thing on. Uh, it's fine. Okay. okay, cool. Um, yeah, so this, I promise, is the only lecture, thank you, is the only lecture that I will give for this class that is not explicitly about PCBs. It is the only one. Um, and I want to prove to you a little bit that this lecture is important by taking a small poll of the class. Also, this lecture requires participation, so please help me out here. Um, how many of you are... How many of you are seniors or higher or older? If you're old, raise your hand. OK. Who is a freshman, sophomore, somewhere around that age? OK, great. So we're around 50-50. Now, raise your hand if you feel confident. If I came up to you and said, I need you to design something for me from scratch, how many of you feel confident that you could do that? Raise your hand. Um, something, like let's say you're an electrical engineer, I came up and told you design a PCB or a power converter or something, how confident are you? If you're a mechanical engineer, how confident are you that you could design a suspension system and not kill your friend? So like 3%, Stefan, put your hand down. Um, <laughs> three, so like three people in the room, great. Um, Okay, so the reason, part of the reason we're giving this class and part of the reason I'm giving this lecture is because when I graduated MIT, oh, six months ago, um, I felt that like classes here are really great at giving you mathematical tools on how to analyze systems, but they aren't great at telling you how do I then use this tool to design a system? How do I, what equations do I apply where to figure out how this thing that I want to do isn't going to explode or, or whatever, or something like that. So my goal today is going to try to like, get you to think about how to design a system from the top down. Now, that may not seem related to PCBs, or it may seem related to PCBs. If it does, it should, because when you're designing anything, the design process doesn't really change when you move from system to system, right? Like you have to identify design requirements, how do you fulfill those design requirements, and then you have to use physics to tell you if the design that you're thinking about is going to work. Physics does not care about your feelings, which is why we have to care about physics as engineers, right? Um, and the way I'm gonna do this is, uh, I'm gonna use that because it's a great prop, if nothing else. Um, but in a little differently, so this is a gas-powered motorcycle. Um, now, we all know that climate change is gonna kill us all very shortly. So how do we solve, yes, woo, um, how do we solve this problem? Um, so for those of you who know, battery-powered vehicles have been on the market for a while now. Lithium batteries have a lot of issues related to them but with safety, procuring lithium, like all this kind of stuff. It is a great solution. It is not necessarily an end-all be-all in, in, the, in the vehicle industry. 
One alternative, I'm not saying the alternative, one alternative is something called hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicles, which is basically you take hydrogen gas, you take oxygen, you shove them together, and then when the electrons come out, you capture that and that generates electricity. So what I'm going to do today is do the system design of a hydrogen fuel cell powered motorcycle, the electrical aspect for Mechies, sorry. Um, this is an electrical engineering class. <laughs> so, um, and I will ask for your participation. I may ask some of you to write things on the board like you are in high school, but I think that's funny and hilarious. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so, what does a motorcycle have to do? Let's start. Move. Move. Actually, you write it. I don't want to write. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> okay, a motorcycle has to go. If it has to go, it has to stop. stop. Uh, Christina, write stop on the board. What else does it have to do? Turn. turn. You raise your hand, so you get to write turn on the board. <laughs> uh, yay. <laughs> yes, a motorcycle fundamentally, as all vehicles do, has to do three things. It has to go, it has to stop. Please don't die. It has to go, stop, and turn. Now, when you're designing a system, like if you were working for Honda or you're working for Harley Davidson, obviously you can't go up to your boss and say like, go, stop, turn, we're done, right? Like there's a lot more you have to do. So the questions in design. <laughs> the turn is in fact turning. Um, Yes, yeah, so go, stop, turn. So the questions in design usually become how much go, how much stop, how much turn, and then after you identify how much go, how much stop, how much turn, you can look at your system and start sizing your components accordingly, right? So let's say we are building a hydrogen-powered motorcycle by modifying an existing motorcycle, which means if I was to take this and turn it into hydrogen power, which means ideally I already have brakes, and ideally I already have steering. So for the purposes of this lecture, let's ignore the, uh, the stop and turn aspect from the design. We'll cover stop a little bit. I'm gonna talk about regenerative braking briefly, um, but it's not gonna be a primary design requirement. So how do we get design requirements? Anyone? Where did my design requirements come from? How fast do I wanna move? Yeah, okay. But I'm not writing today. <laughs> here, here we go. You go. How fast? Speed. So max speed. Max speed also. Anyone else? Another design requirement? Acceleration. Who said acceleration? They're pointing at each other because they don't want to write on the board. One of you is going to have to do it. Um, <laughs> um, someone said something over here. I didn't hear it. Cost is a design requirement. Um, yeah, let's throw it up there. We're not gonna consider it today, but cost is a requirement. Anything else? Power consumption by always something along those lines. Let's call it range. Um, yes, how long will it drive for? Because if it has a range of one mile, that's not frankly useful. Anyone else? Safety would be the other one that I would add to this list, but I think this is a pretty good list for now. Um, great. So now, so now we've decided that max speed, acceleration, cost, range, and safety are things we need to consider when we're designing the system. We are engineers. We need numbers. How do I get numbers? I want a number for speed. I want a number for acceleration. I want a number for cost. I want a number for range. I want a number for safety. How do I do that? Great, but where? So a lot of the time when we, when we look up things on the internet, of course, like we just put it in Google and we look at the first link that comes up and goes like, this is the answer definitively, we're gonna move on, yay. Um, but something I learned when I took um, 270, uh, Professor Alex Slocum's Fundamentals of Design class, if you haven't taken it, would totally recommend it if you're a mechanical engineer, great class. Um, 
one of the best places to actually get information on transportation systems, such as bikes, cars, what this kind of stuff, is the Department of Transportation, because it actually maintains a huge database on things like energy consumption of vehicles and all this kind of stuff. So now we can start design. And the way I'm going to start design. No, we're going to leave that there. I want that. Um, so first, when it comes to when it comes to electric vehicles and a lot of other things, range is always our like primary, um, our like one of our primary concerns because batteries are heavy and getting getting a lot of range out of batteries like you need a heavy battery. Um, but the way the way we're going to approach this is through energy. Energy is one of physics' fundamental quantities. It's our limit. We need to figure out how much energy is going into the system. We need to figure out how much energy is going out of the system. We need to figure out how much energy we can store. Right? So if you go to Department of Transportation website and you look up, this is not on the screen. Sorry. Um, and you look up, uh, you can search like, light vehicle, I think it's called like lightweight vehicle average energy consumption. Um, you can get a whole bunch of statistics on in this value called energy per person mile. And basically what that means is the amount of gas one of these vehicle uses for one person to go one mile. Now, I assume that is based on the average mass of a human being. Um, we don't really know that number. We're going to assume a couple of things while we do this. But that number, as you can see here, is this is the worst piece of chalk ever. 0 0.659, what does that say? Kilowatt hours per mile. Yeah. So this is the number we are now design assumption number one. This is the number we're going to base our entire design off of right now because it is based in measured data that we can collect from online. Of course, this number is dependent on things like the mass of the bike, the mass of the person riding the bike, the fuel efficiency of the system, and all this kind of stuff. It is a good starting point. It's not an end-all, be-all. When you start designing a system, you want to start with something that like, you can measure and read and go from and come up with like preliminary sizes of components, and then you'll circle back around after the analysis. You'll determine if that's feasible. And once you've determined that's feasible, then you can do higher levels of analysis to figure out if your system's going to work. Now, before we move on, I do actually want to draw what this system looks like, because most of you may not know. Um, so a hydrogen fuel cell powered motorcycle is going to fundamentally have like five or six components. You're going to have fuel cell. You're going to have hydrogen tank. The fuel cell's job is to take hydrogen in. It's going to take oxygen in from the air. We don't need to store the oxygen. It's going to generate electricity. Electricity is going to go to a battery. Now, you might be saying, didn't you just say batteries suck? Why do we have a battery? So the problem with fuel cells, um, if you do a little bit of research, I can also pull up a discharge curve if anybody's interested. Fuel cells are really great at outputting a very steady, constant stream of low power. But electric vehicles, like when you accelerate, when you brake, when you do all this kind of stuff, you get a very, very jerky power draw. Your power looks like, I don't know, like it's not consistent at all. This is what your power draw looks like. Just believe me on that for now. Um, if you put this through a fuel cell, it will be so unhappy with you that it will literally explode. Um, so we don't want to do that. The battery kind of acts as a filter here. During these high power draw regions, the battery kind of pulls that draw out of the, like it, it takes the, what am I trying to say? It takes that, that energy draw so the fuel cell doesn't have to, and then the fuel cell can recharge the battery. Now, the battery powers a motor controller. The motor controller goes to a motor. And this goes through some gear ratio Ow. that goes to a wheel. So it looks, looks like this. 
Yeah? So there's a whole bunch of things we need to ask ourselves about this system, right? Like, I just have a bunch of squares on a board. I have nothing. Um, batteries have a voltage. They have a capacity. They have current draw. They have all these, all these kinds of things. How do I find the voltage of the battery? How do I find the capacity of the battery? How do I find the energy density of this battery? Motor controller, we are not really going to touch right now in this lecture because we're going to do a whole lecture on it on, um, on Friday. And these get very hairy um, when it comes to design, but we can size a motor. Motors have a maximum torque. They have a maximum speed. They have a torque speed curve, which if you have no idea what a torque speed curve is, don't panic. I will come back to it in like five minutes. But they have parameters, right, that we have to design to. What are those? Fuel cell, um, for purposes of this lecture, we're going to assume that this fuel cell is a 1.2 kilowatt fuel cell, which means it will output 1.2 kilowatts constant power, and it will follow a discharge curve. Fuel cells follow, it's not a discharge curve, sorry, it's a power draw curve. Fuel cells have, and all electrical systems, when you draw power out of them, they follow a certain curve. So for fuel cells, it's um, uh, depending on the current you're drawing out of the fuel cell, the voltage will actually derate quite steeply. So for a lot of fuel cells, this curve can go from like 80 volts all the way down to 50 volts, even when you're drawing. Um, so this axis is actually a current density based on the area of the fuel cell. Don't worry about it too much. We're not going to touch it too much in this lecture. But if you're curious, that's something you can Google. Um, so we're going to assume the fuel cell outputs 1.2 kilowatts. What am I doing on time? OK. 1.2 kilowatts. And then big question mark. How big does that fuel tank have to be? Because at the end of the day, if we come up with a fuel tank that needs to be six meters long, it's really not going to fit. Um, so when you first start designing a system, you want to start with numbers like this that you can pull off the internet. And then you want to move to, I want to size all of these components to a reasonable amount. What are the biggest components in my system? How can I size them? Can I determine if this system is even feasible by determining the size of these components and the size of the system I have? Because size is going to be our limiting factor here, right? Can I fit all of this on a bike and still get reasonable amounts of range? Um, you can get rid of this. So we have this number that we're going to use as a basis. Now, range. How do I find how much range I want? Anyone on range? Yes, but if I'm designing a system for like, like, let's say I'm designing it for city commuting, there's a minimum range that I will need to make my product viable, right? So how would I find a number for that? Go back to Google. Go back to Google. Um, what specifically would you Google? Um, I'd probably just look up what the average range of gas powered bikes are and also some electric ones with the batteries. That's fair. Um, you could do that. That will get you a number that's very high because gas, the, the nice thing about motorcycles is they're actually, they're very light, so they're incredibly fuel efficient, which means that thing, even though, the, even though it's from 1974, gets 70 miles to the gallon, believe it or not, because it's very light. Um, so gas-powered range, that has a two-gallon fuel tank, I can go like 600 miles or something. That map probably doesn't work out, but like, you get the point. <laughs> like, you can go very far. So. Um, the way I chose to do it is I figured out, let's say, let's constrain our system a little bit more by saying, okay, I'm going to use this bike that I'm designing to commute to work, and, as opposed to saying, like, I want to drive from here to California on one tank of gas, because that's not, not a great design spec to start out with, right? Let's bound our problem to, like, a reasonable set of conditions. So we have this number. Average number of motorcycle uh, miles a motorcycle drives each year. Um, or you could do the average number of miles a person commutes to work each year. What I'm going to do is take this number, the 3,000 miles um, a year, divide it by the number of working days in a year, and come up with a uh, multiply that by five. So you can get like 
number of working days. So it's, sorry, I should just write it. Um, 3,000 miles per year over, I think it's like 270 working days each year, that's weekdays, times five weekdays a week. I only want to fill up once a week. I don't want to fill up every day. I don't want to charge the bike every day. Yes, this is true. But I'm saying for now, we should constrain our problem to something reasonable. And then when you get number, like the next stage of design, you would totally consider things like that. But in this first stage of design, we are just trying to figure out, can I even fit this on that? Right, okay, sure. This is probably not a great number, which is why I was saying I think we should probably change this to the average of distance somebody commutes in a city. Right. Yeah. Um, so like the average number that a motorcycle drives a year, yeah, I agree, is not a great number. Um, but for argument's sake, let's pretend. Um, yes, but that is also a number you could easily still find. Um, Yes, so this gives us a range. I think it's something like roughly 60 miles of range we need at minimum. Uh, okay. So I now have a range, I now have a range spec. Let's say I need to drive 60 miles a week if I want to fill up only once a week. And I have an energy rating of a motorcycle. So remember, this is energy in fuel use. This is how much fuel is used. So how do we get how many kilowatt hours of energy this system needs to store? Because it's about how much energy I need to store, right? Is anybody lost? Have I lost anybody yet? Don't be shy. OK. Um, how would I get how many kilowatt hours I need to store? There you go. It's not a trick question. So it's like 60 times 0 0.659. Uh, the only thing we do need to adjust for here is the efficiency of a gas engine. This is the amount of gas I am using. So. If a gas engine is 35% efficient, the amount of energy that it takes me to actually drive the bike along the road is going to be this times 35%. Does that make sense? The amount of energy that actually is used to move the bike if the rest is in losses in the, in the engine. Cool. Slow nods. Nice. OK. So, the reason I am doing this is because if I just took this number over here and didn't include this 35% efficiency, this would basically, like, the amount of energy I would have to store in a battery is massive because internal combustion engines are hugely inefficient. Whereas electric systems, if you design them well, you can get up to 70 to 90% efficiency. So really, you don't need to store all this, like you need to store a lot of energy in terms of fuel and internal combustion engine to get range because you're horribly inefficient in turning that energy into actual like road work. But you don't necessarily need it for an electrical system. You're like, you can store energy at a higher, like you can store a small amount of energy because your system is more efficient. Um, what's this number? I have this number somewhere. Yes, OK, so here's the number. This is, if this math is wrong, I apologize in advance. Um, but this, I think, is roughly 10 kilowatt hours of energy storage, um, road energy. Um, now, basically what that is saying is I need 10 kilowatt hours to move myself on this bike um, no, uh, 60 miles, 60 miles on this bike, yes? We, and that is basically when I do the force at the wheel patch 
time, like the like when I do energy of the bike as it is moving, that is like the energy that is transferred from the bike to the road. That is what's happening at the wheel patch. It's not anything else that's in the system, right? So now I have to consider. So that's like this is like 10 kilowatt hours of energy. So bear with me for a second. I'm going to say you need to store 10 kilowatt hours of road energy. You can't like you do have to go through the entire system, right? In terms like storage happens here, storage doesn't happen here. But if we assumed that the wheel could transfer and store energy directly to the road, which it cannot do, I would need 10 kilowatt hours of energy storage. Does that number is everyone following me there? Cool. So now I have a gear train, which at best has an efficiency, let's call it 70%. Actually, this can go as high as 80, I think. Um, a motor, motors can get efficiency as high as 90%. We're just going to ignore the motor controller for now. Um, but the motor controller motor combination can go between, you can get up to 90% if you design it well. Um, People on race car and solar car are laughing at me because this is a very high efficiency number, but um, for now, we're going to work with it. Um, and then we get to the battery is actually storing the energy. So if I wanted to figure out how much energy the battery has to store, I take the 10 kilowatt hours of energy I need to store, divide it by efficiency number one, divide it by efficiency number two, and I get the amount of energy I need to store in the battery, which I think is like... I have this number here. Um, like that energy, I think, is like 15 to 20 kilo, something like 15 to 20 kilowatts. Now, that assumes the battery stores the entire amount of energy I need to drive 60 miles. Now, why are we making this assumption? Because we also have this whole hydrogen thing going on up here that's also storing energy. So why would we make an assumption like this? Anyone have any guesses as to why that's a good assumption? OK. So man. Out of boards here. OK. So the reason we probably want that power graph. The reason we're going to make this assumption is because if I assume the range comes from a combination of this and this, that means when the bike is fully out of energy, when I have gone 60 miles, that means both my hydrogen tank and my battery are completely empty. Do people agree with that statement? Yes? If I wanted to interact with this bike as a user in a way such that I am only filling up the hydrogen tank, every week, and I don't also want to charge the battery, then this needs to store as much energy as this. And the amount of energy this needs to store must equal the amount of energy I need to go 60 miles so that this can fully recharge this. Who did I lose? Great. Where did I lose you? We'll get to that, so that is an assumption we have to make. Um, but if we just consider the amount of energy storage and not the rate at the moment, which is a little bit of a weird assumption to make right now, if we just consider the amount, if I store, like for example, 10 kilowatts here, and 10 kilowatts takes me 60 miles, sorry, 10 kilowatt hours takes me 60 miles, then this tank has to store 10 kilowatt hours to fully recharge that battery, right? Does that make sense? Is that So this comes down to what you want to do in the sense of like mostly hybrid vehicles, the internal combustion engine doesn't recharge the battery when the vehicle is stationary because it's polluting into the atmosphere and like you're going to gas everybody around you, which you don't want to do. 
But the nice part about hydrogen fuel <laughs> um, is that it only releases uh, like water vapor. So if it's, st and it also doesn't make noise. So if you're just stationary standing there um, and you're recharging, like while, I don't know, you're going and doing grocery shopping, this is not a problem, right? Um, so one of the other things I did is in the lecture notes, there's a paper linked that was written about this entire design process um, for a class. And in that paper, we calculate, we define a time called like time to recharge, and it kind of goes through that explanation if you're interested. Um, yes, okay. So, we said, we said this is what, 15 kilowatt hours? Okay, this is 15 kilowatt hours, we need 10 kilowatt hours to roll, so now I want to size my hydrogen tank. Um, fuel cells, at best, 60% efficient. So this has to store about 26 kilowatt hours. And we can assume that the energy transfer from, which a fluids person will laugh at me about this, but an, the energy transfer from this tank to here is perfect, which it isn't. But for argument's sake, let's assume that's perfect and say we need to store 26 kilowatt hours here of just gas that will be converted at 60% efficiency to this battery, and I'll store 15 kilowatt hours, and then this will store, and then 10 kilowatt hours after the drivetrain will go into moving me 60 miles. Cool? Okay. So then, how do we how do we now figure out the size of these components? Because this is not the limiting size component. This is not the limiting size component. I can fit all of these. Battery big, tank big. How do I figure out the size of those things? How about this one, battery? Either. I don't have, I haven't chosen a battery yet. I don't have a data sheet. I don't know how much capacity I have. I don't know how many volts I want. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't understand that. So you but <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay, yes, true. But then we're getting a little bit too far into series and parallel configuration of batteries and things like that. And I don't even want to do that now because I don't have, um, or maybe you don't need to do that, but there's a simpler way, which is lithium has an energy density number, correct? All, like the way we store, like lithium always has an energy density number. It's something like, um, it's, over, it's over here. Uh, it's 400 watt hours per liter of unit volume. Now that's raw, that's raw lithium. How much energy can it store when you're charging it with a battery? This is a tested number that you can also find online. So if I have that number, I can reasonably find how big this needs to be, right? Now that, of course, is raw lithium. That's none of the packaging and the other things that needs to ground it, but it, again, reasonable number for now. Um, for this, uh, hydrogen is usually stored, did everyone, is everyone okay with battery sizing? Did I confuse everyone, lose anyone? No, great. Um, this hydrogen is usually stored at pressure. Um, the reason we store it at pressure is because you can just keep, like since it's a gas, you can press it, store it at pressure, you get um, more, more gas in the tank if you store it at pressure and therefore you can store more energy. Um, if I wanted to figure out the volume of that tank quickly, how would I, what chemistry formula, I hate this microphone. What chemistry formula from high school could I use? Uh, to figure out how much volume, how much volume does this tank have to be to store a certain amount of hydrogen at a certain pressure? 
Ideal gas law, yay, you would never thought you'd see that ever again, but here it is. Um, yes, so all this is to say, here is the process to size these components if I was designing an end system starting from nothing. Does everybody follow like how we did that? Less so, did you understand the engineering? Um, so the point of this is what I would go, what I would do next is I would say like, okay, I know how big this is because I sized it and I know how big this is and I would look at what is the volume, I would literally sit there, tape measure, X, Y, Z, what's the volume and figure out would that even fit on something like this? Yeah? Turns out the answer is yes, which is great because then we haven't wasted our time completely. Um, but that's also a good answer to have, right? Because if it doesn't fit, then you know you probably need to rethink your design method. Um, okay, so now we get to things like, uh, yeah, where'd it go? Voltage of a battery, capacity of a battery, how do I size a motor? Um, and the way does anybody have any ideas on how they would approach this? Voltage of a battery, current, like you know how much energy this battery needs to store. What other specs do I need to know to size, size this system? And how do I how do I get so yes you want you want your voltage you want your current and you're going to get that from the torque of your motor and the speed of the motor um, but before I even get here this comes from my this comes from my acceleration spec right so I want to figure out how fast I'm going to accelerate then based on that I figure out how much mass I have then based on that I figure out how much torque I need and then I can size the motor that way. So um, I think I'm gonna do those couple things quickly and we're gonna end early today. Um, and then starting Wednesday, we're gonna do, like we're gonna get really into PCB design. This was just more an exercise to get you guys thinking. Um, but yes, so typical, typical bike accelerations, I can also Google, um, around 4.3 meters per second square, that's roughly half a G, right? Um, now, when I'm sizing a system like this, I need to size it for peak power, right? I need my system to always work when it's at maximum power draw. There are two points of maximum power draw in um, an electrical vehicle or any vehicle system. What are those two points? Like where, where, where do I need the most energy out of my system? Starting from rest, so acceleration, maximum acceleration, and then? Max speed. The limits, like, the limit of acceleration, how fast I can accelerate, comes from my electrical system limit, right? Like, if my electrical system could accelerate my system faster than this number, then I could accelerate faster. But if I'm accelerating at that, and that is my limit, that limit comes from the power system's limit, right? Similarly, max speed, if I could go faster, I would. But if I'm limited, like this is, this is moving your thing. So that is your limit. So there are two limits here. Um, there's the max speed. How do I figure out, um, how do I figure out how much torque I need at max speed system? Torque speed curve tells you what a motor can do. How do I just figure out how much force I need to move this thing along at speed? Drag force. Force equals, if you don't know this formula, that's okay. But at speed, there's one force on, there's, okay, there's more than one. But the, the main force on a bike at speed, which is why it's so difficult to get like vehicles, like for example, I uh, like small cars don't have that many horsepower. It's in the range of 100 to 200 horsepower. They can still hit 100 miles an hour. To get 
to 200 miles an hour, the Bugatti Veyron needs 1,000 horsepower, which is a tenfold increase in, in horsepower. It's also massive, but um, aerodynamic drag is a squared, squared increase. So it's, the, it's your fundamental limit. So it's rho CD B squared A over two. Now, what does this even mean? Um, rho is the density of air. That should make sense. If I'm moving through a fluid, the resistance that the fluid pushes back with me with should be related to the density of the fluid. CD is the coefficient of drag of a vehicle. This is a weird number. You can only get it from like shoving things in a wind tunnel. You have to measure that. Velocity is, um, velocity is velocity. Area is the cross-sectional area of the, the front of the bike. And then over two is the relation. So um, if I come here, I can figure out this force at speed for my bike, right? Um, if you assume, so based on, for this thing, I, I Googled, oh, sorry. I Googled um, A um, for a typical motorcycle. I Googled the coefficient of drag of a typical motorcycle with a rider on it. And then for a velocity, I chose, let's say, we want to max out at 70 miles per hour because that's a reasonable speed. Right now, we don't really need to go faster. Um, and that will also, my speed will help size my system down a little bit. Um, then my other limit is acceleration. So in this case, it's just force equals mass times acceleration. And mass of the bike, you can assume, like, you can also Google an, like, an average number, right? Um, so this gives me, uh, oh, sorry, this is one other thing we have to do. Um, so motors are limited, and we're also going to do electron motors. So if you don't fully understand what I'm about to say, it's OK. We're going to come back to it, especially for track two people if you're designing a motor controller. Um, motors have a limit, and that limit is defined by what's called the torque speed curve of a motor. That's how you define a motor's performance. And this should make some fundamental amount of sense, right? Like I put energy into my motor that's electrical energy. In terms of, can I even not say this? I'm kind of writing a quarter here. OK. This, I'm putting some electrical energy in. I'm going to get some mechanical energy out. Um, and the motor is never going to create power. Mechanical energy is torque times speed. Electrical energy is voltage times current, which should tell you there's going to be some relationship between the torque the motor produces and the speed, because um, and that limit, the limit is defined like this. Sorry. So at certain torques, the, the motor has three limits. It's like here and here. At this is the speed axis, how fast the motor is spinning. This is the torque axis, how much torque it can produce. Up here is a line we called the saturation torque for larger motors. If you've taken 2007, you might have seen a similar graph to something like this, except it doesn't have this decapitation over here. It's just a line like that. This is called saturation torque. You have to consider it in larger motors. And basically what happens is motors run, motors have a magnetic field that spins them, produces the torque. Um, and the core of the motor is made of iron or some other magnetic metal. And basically, this tells me I physically cannot shove more magnetic field through this piece of metal because it has saturated. All my little magnets have gone this way. I can't get more. I can't get them to align more. They're all aligned. And then this D ratio, the, oh, sorry. This is max speed. We'll get back to this in a second because that's kind of a hairy limit to talk about. But this, this line should also make sense in the sense of like, after I reach, let's say my motor has a peak power rating. This is the peak power of my motor before which, like, let's say it's a 10 kilowatt motor. It's not going to create energy after that, right? If I ask it for more torque, the speed has to reduce to match. Because it has a power rate. It's a physical device. It will have a power rating. Does that, does that make sense? Um, 
Other fun thing about motors, and I don't want to get too much in detail to confuse you guys, this line is actually dependent on voltage. Sorry. But basically, for a general model of a motor, if you want a system, a simple one, the torque of a motor is proportional to some constant that we measure times the current going through it. The speed of the motor is proportional to the same constant to, nope. <laughs> voltage speed times the voltage. And this defines, this limit down here defines the maximum speed of my motor, and this voltage over here is my battery voltage, because that's the maximum amount of voltage I can put into the system. So this, this point over here is going to be defined by the voltage of my battery. Does that make sense? Have I lost anyone? So basically, on this torque speed curve, what I'm trying to tell you is you have a couple regions here, right? You have like, you have a, my motor can produce this torque at max. It can produce this speed at that maximum torque. It can go up to that speed. These speeds are defined by the voltage of the battery. The torque is defined by the motor itself. Sometimes you will hear the phrase, if you have a motor, you can increase voltage and get infinite gain in performance until it explodes. This is kind of true to some extent, in the sense that like, if I increase the voltage, right, if I measure this torque speed curve at a battery voltage of 12 volts, and I increase the voltage to 24 volts, then the torque speed curve looks like this. I get this increase area in performance that I can now achieve. Does that make sense? Some of you are looking at me confused. Don't fully, you don't need to fully understand why it moves like this. I'm just trying to make the point that it does move like this when you increase voltage so I can show you how to size a motor. Does that make sense? So, and basically, a motor can achieve any performance under the torque speed curve, um, but not over it. Like, a motor cannot produce anything up here. This is the no-go zone, and this is, this is all what it can do. All this is to say, this is how we define the limits of a motor. And basically, what I want is, I know the amount of torque I'm going to need based on this force and the radius of the wheel at these points, and what speed I'm going, right? I can define these. Did I, did I lose people? Okay, I can define the force, the force and the speed. I can define the force and the speed. And based on that, I can say, I want, let's say this is this force, this speed, that I, I can plot that on this graph. I can plot that on this graph, this is your max speed point, this is your max acceleration point. And then what I can do is like I can look at different motors and I can see it falling under that curve. And then I can also size my battery voltage because I can play with battery voltage and see if it will fall under my curve, right? I'm gonna show you that quickly. Um, please don't hate me, I use numbers. I don't use Excel. I know, I'm, I'm, it's a crime, I'm sorry. Okay, so over here, this is the torque speed curve of uh, uh, just a random motor that I, that I happen to pick. This slider adjusts voltage. So if I increase the voltage, you can see the performance change. Um, and these two points are my, uh, are my limits that I defined over there. Is everyone following me? Cool. So, based on this, what I can do is I can say, okay, I'm going to bring down my, my voltage to 
let's say that's 70 volts, that means I need a battery voltage of at least 70 volts to achieve the performance I want to achieve, right? So now what I have just done is I've sized my motor by, so, and by the way, where I got the torque speed curve is I searched up a whole, I Googled electric motorcycle motors, I looked, took, the, took a list of them, and I looked at the, the, basically the main points that are like max speed, peak power point, and saturation torque. Yeah? And then you can see down here I compared, I compared a bunch of them, but for argument's sake, I'm showing you the one that works. But now you can, now you can see I've sized the motor, and I've also determined what voltage does my battery have to be at. My battery needs to be at least 70 volts to achieve 70 miles an hour at half a G of acceleration. Right? Based on that number, what I can do is I can go back and say, now that I've sized my voltage at 70 volts, I have a kilowatt hour amount I want to store in my battery. Divide kilowatt hours by volts, I get the capacity. I can get series and parallel configuration from that. Yeah? And then, um, so we have sized this, we have sized this, and then for the fuel cell stuff, we can just, we're, we're not gonna get into that in detail today because it's like, this is what it looks like, it's very fun. Um, but yes. So I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get you guys to think about is how do, you, how do you size these components without knowing anything about the system beforehand? Um, so notice like we didn't even go into detail on like what kind of battery cells I'm using. Is it series, is it parallel? How, what's the configuration and all that kind of stuff? You don't need to know any of those details yet. We've just come to like I need a battery of this voltage and this capacity like knowing nothing about the system to start with. And then the same thing with the motor, you don't have to go and search up 20 different motors to figure out which motor is gonna fit for your system. If you like ask yourself questions about what the system has to do to start with, you could have figured out like, um, okay, if you plot these first, I need a motor that achieves at least this amount of torque. I need a motor that achieves at least this amount of speed. And then you can start, you can start Google it. When you start Googling, you can start searching for motors you know that have this amount of torque before you start searching in the blind. Is that people following me? Cool. Okay. That is all I have for today, unless people have questions. Um, the lecture on... Uh, the lecture on Wednesday, Fisher is going to go through like basics of PCBs, and then the lab tomorrow, we're gonna start learning Altium. So if you haven't installed Altium, please install Altium. If you are having trouble with virtual machines, we know we are trying to work that out as soon as possible. Um, yeah, thank you all for listening, um, and welcome to class.